Today, it is our privilege to be speaking with Monsignor Kevin Irwin. Monsignor Irwin is a priest of the Archdiocese of New York. He served as the Dean of the School of Theology and Religious Studies at the Catholic University of America and currently holds the Walter J. Schmitz Chair of Liturgical Studies at the Catholic University of America. Monsignor Irwin is the author of 16 books on liturgy and sacraments, including Liturgy, Prayer, and Spirituality, Liturgical Theology, a Primer, Context and Text, Method in Liturgical Theology, and Responses to 101 Questions on the Mass, available in a revised edition uh, from 2012 from Paulus Press. Monsignor Irwin is also the author of the book that we'll be discussing today, Models of the Eucharist, also available from Paulist Press, and we'll have the privilege of discussing this book with him. An internationally recognized expert on the theology of the sacraments, Monsignor Irwin is the author of, the, uh, of articles on the sacraments in such standard works as the New Catholic Encyclopedia, the New Dictionary of Sacramental Worship, and the New Dictionary of Catholic Spirituality. Monsignor Irwin has also authored over 50 articles and 60 reviews in scholarly journals. And since 2004, Monsignor Irwin has also served as an advisor to the United States Bishops Committee on Divine Worship. Thank you so much for joining us today. Monsignor Irwin, while I was a PhD student at Fordham University, I had the privilege of serving as the graduate assistant to the late Avery Cardinal Dulles. And I should say for our listeners' benefit that in 1974, Cardinal Dulles published a theological classic entitled Models of the Church. In what ways did you pattern your own study or were you perhaps influenced in your own study by this book from Cardinal Dulles? Well, I was, and before Cardinal Dulles went to Fordham, he was on our faculty here at Catholic University for several years. And I, I became something of a, of a disciple of his, although um, at a somewhat at a distance because he was a rather formidable character and at all the, the, uh, the systematic folks around him. So liturgy and sacraments was not his favorite thing, but he influenced me in the sense that the book tries to, I think, come to the same sort of, of kaleidoscope of images in ways of looking at the church. So similarly, I thought the same thing about the models approach so that it would take Roman Catholics out of just a couple of usual categories like presence and sacrifice and open up other ideas and that was certainly his influence. Hmm. Hmm. Monsignor Irwin, at the introduction of the book, you call the celebration of the Eucharist the, quote, jewel of the crown of Catholicism. And as we read on, you appeal to this metaphor to explain that the doctrine of the Eucharist has many facets, but you also mean something else by this metaphor. And I understand that you mean this metaphor to speak to the centrality of the doctrine of the Eucharist in Catholic theology. I can only ask this question from my own tradition as an evangelical, but what do you mean when you say that Roman Catholicism is a Christian tradition that is particularly focused on sacramental life? Well, I appreciate that the, the question is a, is a, a very um, profound one in the sense that when I say the Eucharist is a jewel in the crown of Catholicism, uh, part of that is my understanding that the, the actual celebration of the Eucharist is what makes the church the church. And so it is really uh, always the Eucharist building up the church and the church celebrating the Eucharist. That's a, uh, that's a, a coterminous thing. And the action, the event of that is really how we appreciate what the Eucharist means. It's a doctrine, but before and after the doctrine, it's a lived reality that, that characterizes Catholicism in terms of, it's this, we, we call it from the documents of Vatican II, it's the summit and the source of our life. So it, mm. it, it's the pulsating heart of Catholic life. Therefore, um, I say the jewel in kind of Catholicism, meaning it's, it's, a, it's a crown jewel. It, and really, I would argue theologically that everything we believe happens in the liturgy of the Eucharist, and therefore, it really is a celebration of, of our faith. Help me see that connection, how it is that ecclesiology and sacramental theology are linked in such an intimate way. Well, um, there's, a, there's a phrase out of the patristic era that um, the Eucharist builds the church and the church 
uh, celebrates the Eucharist. It's, it's, it's always coterminous. In Catholicism, mm -hmm. uh, and we're, talk, we're trying to these days uh, evaluate what, is, what does Catholicism mean in the, in the modern world. At the end of the day, um, we're in this together. We do this together as a, as a, as a church, as a body of Christ, um, local church, um, university chapel, um, diocesan cathedral, St. Peter's in Rome, we're all intertwined. So the sense of being in this together and therefore we celebrate this and then we live the reality by serving others, that's, that's what Catholicism is in its, its very nature. It is, it is not a, a religion that is about um, I or me, it's all about we and us. And that's kind of the guts of it. And the Eucharist always shapes that, forms that, and supports that. Hmm. You've said something that intrigues me deeply, and that is that the Eucharist is what makes the church the church. How does that work? Uh, please help me see that. Well, um, we rely upon the testimony of the early first Christian martyrs who say, "Without Eucharist, we cannot exist." It's it's we 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 are a, we are a liturgical praying church that has doctrines and belief systems. But at the end of the day, we're a praying church and we're a liturgical church, and that's what makes this work. That's hmm. before all of our doctrines. Hmm. Thank you so much for that reflection. Monsignor Irwin, um, again, I can only speak as an evangelical when I ask this question, so forgive me if I don't have the question quite right, but here's my attempt at it. Um, what grounds the doctrine, this the sacramental emphasis that we see in Roman Catholicism, what grounds that historically? And so I'm thinking again as a Protestant here, and I'm thinking of my own tradition, which uh, has a high place for sola scriptura, value of scripture. And as I look back into the history of Protestantism, I can see clearly what, what grounds that emphasis, the tumultuous events of the 16th century. It, looking historically into Roman Catholicism, where does that emphasis come from? What grounds that? Well. Uh all of us together, your tradition, many others, and mine, borrowed all of this from Judaism. Hmm. And the, Jude the, 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 the Jewish cult was in the synagogue for the word service, at the temple to offer sacrifice, and in the home for a meal. And you put all those things together in various permutations, depending upon your tradition and where you are, that's where it all comes from. And so in that sense, hmm. Catholicism upheld uh, through the difficulties of the, of the Reformation, we upheld the altar table, sacrifice and meal, and upheld that in a way that other traditions did not, but yet it all goes back to where the Jews celebrated those things, and therefore that permeates our tradition, your tradition. But it's, mm. uh, it's and historical circumstances, I think, have influenced that. Now, mm. in fairness, uh, before the Reformation, um, there were times and places when the Eucharist was celebrated probably poorly, privately, um, sometimes uh, uh, maybe so frequently that it became kind of routine, and so they, and it was given under not given under those species a number of things that we, that reformers criticized us for, and yet um, what happened at the Trent, the Council of Trent, that defined much of this, um, we became a bit more defensive and put forward our strong suit on on the altar table side of it, and other folks went a different direction, and I think right now we're coming to a certain amount of harmonious uh, integration. Hmm. If I can ask a question that I'm just formulating now as I'm speaking with you, is it necessary for Christians to have a certain metaphysic as they approach sacramental theology? I think what makes sacramental theology difficult for many Americans, perhaps especially younger Americans, is we just don't have a metaphysic. Is, is there some sort of philosophical base that's necessary to understand what's really going on in this Christian theology of the sacraments? Well, uh, very astute question, and that was well formulated. That is to say, until fairly recently in Catholicism, you would study liturgy, and that would be the historical evolution of the rites, what they looked like in the 5th century, 12th century, 16th, 20th, and that would be an historical study with some theological underpinnings. You would study sacramental theology based on people like Augustine or Aquinas, who had hmm. their own philosophy and their own terminology to use. Well, um, there is an ancient patristic principle, what we pray is what we believe. So Ronnie Lex Credendi, we hmm. pray and believe. So um, since Vatican II, a number of liturgical scholars, myself included, have tried to incorporate that idea and suggest that maybe we should not separate liturgy and sacraments. 
maybe we should join liturgy and sacraments. And as a matter mm. of fact, maybe the better way to go is not to insist on neither Christianism or Aristotelianism, but maybe we should allow the dynamic of the liturgy to inform our theology. Mm. So as a matter of fact, uh, that's why this book has elements uh, based on the liturgy mm. itself to explore the, the, the ten models. That's a, one way of doing this to get away from simply, uh, dare I say, a very, very refined metaphysic. I don't hmm. think we have that. Hmm. Thank you for that reflection. Monsignor Irwin, in your book, Models of the Eucharist, the first uh, model that you present is entitled Cosmic Mass. Please explain what you mean by the word cosmic when you say that the Mass is cosmic. Well, um, I, I want to be careful and not, not be very new agey here. I, I, I want to insist that the issue here is that um, the celebration of liturgy and sacraments, part of its foundation is that we use the things of this world to worship God. So morning prayer, evening prayer, light, darkness, dawn, dusk. Um, in baptism, we use water to celebrate new life because water, except for air, is the only element without which we cannot live. So hmm. if water sustains life, water in baptism gives us new life. Hmm. So the question, therefore, is what, what, are, what is this, what is this um, foundation in the world, my, I say worldly worship, things we use and, and to, to raise them up and to get, give a bit more consciousness of the value of things like bread and wine and oil and wax and prism and those things, because that's part of the fabric of liturgy and sacraments. Dare I say, uh, I think since Vatican II, uh, part of our tradition has been so concerned about getting the words right that maybe we've ignored some of that, some of that um, earthiness of the liturgy, that primalness of the liturgy, and that was the purpose of that chapter in some, some, some sort of uh, sacramental terms, sacrament are sacred signs, but under them is the doctrine of sacramentality, meaning that throughout the, in, in the world, we discover God, and in liturgy, we choose things from the world to help us worship God. Hmm. That makes any hmm. sense. I, I think it does. And if I can again, uh, just ask a, a question as we're working here together. Um, so forgive me if it's not quite formulated, right? But it seems to me that in order to hold uh, to a, a, a theology of sacraments, something is underpinning that. It's, it's a doctrine of the providence of God, that all of these symbols and signs that are in the world are not accidental, but that, that God is robustly upholding all of his created signs. There must be more to it. Help me understand what's under, under this sacramental theology. What does a sacramental theology reve reveal about our belief about God? Well, it reveals our belief about God, about our need for salvation, and it, re and, and it also um, reveals our relatedness to the world and our responsibility for the world. I'll give an hmm. example. Now, Pope Francis's new encyclical just came out in, in June. And uh, it's a very, very important document for us because it, it, uh, it, it rediscovers the theology of creation, that that's the gift mm. of God, and how God creates and sustains it, and then our responsibility for it. And he speaks about things such as water pollution and um, mm. that, that one third of the food that we produce gets wasted, whereas 20% mm. of the world faces hunger every day. I mean, it's, 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 it's not to make it just a, a mm. kind of a, a, a a justice issue only, but it is a justice issue, and hmm. therefore, water pollution uh, and and distribution of food. The Pope reminds us that's already in our sacramental celebrations and our tradition. So hmm. that's part of it as well in terms of understanding our relatedness and our responsibility to the world. Hmm, that's remarkable. Thank you. Thank you for helping me see some of those connections. Um, Monsignor Irwin, the fifth model in your book is entitled covenant renewal, and in this chapter, you helpfully review some biblical evidence on God's covenants with Noah, for example, Abraham, Moses, David, and also the new covenant promised, uh, prophesied by Jeremiah. Um, help me here. Doesn't the author of Hebrews teach that, quote, we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all, and I'm citing there Hebrews 10.10, why then would the new covenant established by Christ's sacrifice on the cross require renewal? Well, we do this not for God's sake, but for our sake. 
we need to renew it. We need to be mm -hmm. reminded and immersed in that covenant again. And our belief is that when we celebrate the liturgy of the Eucharist, we are immersed in that covenant. And once again, God's overarching love overwhelms us. And we must respond to that in, in any way, shape that we can to renew mm -hmm. that covenant. So it's it's God's largesse, but it's not taking it for granted. And so we, we re it's our need, our human need, because we're fallible, we, we make mistakes, we are we, we sin, uh, we do inappropriate things, and we need, for our sake, we need to welcome that again from God's graciousness. Now, I'll give an example mm. about that. Um, way back when, when I was doing my doctoral dissertation in Rome, I wrote in my mm. dissertation that um, our response to the liturgy has to be um, as equal as God's invitation to us and his graciousness. Of course, that's heresy. Um, they didn't check me on that, but I mean, we can't ever do it the way God does it. It's it's really an overwhelming sense that that God is so loving and so gracious and so generous. Our response is as much as we can do that in the liturgy by way of faith and demonstration of the of, of the action of the liturgy, but also how we live our lives, and that's how the covenant gets renewed. But it's, it's on our side. We need this. It's not for hmm. God's sake. Hmm. I, I have the sense that many evangelicals are misunderstanding something about the Catholic doctrine of the Eucharist. And it seems that the potential objection would be that Christ is physically offered a second time. And evangelicals don't know what to do with this. This seems to be contrary to some of the teachings in Hebrews. What is it that we need to understand about the Catholic doctrine of the, uh, of the Eucharist to potentially come by this, this stumbling block? Well, a couple of things. Number one is um, Christ physically died once. That will never happen again. Uh, and, you're, and the Hebrews text is exactly correct. And so Christ's once and for all sacrifice is, is available to us and is valuable for all time. Fair enough. Um, the question of our, it's, it's really like the covenant renewal, but we hmm. need to tap into that. We need to draw from that, not to repeat it, redo it, it's rather that we take part in that sacrifice, which is occurring still, not again, but still in the Eucharist. And that's why it's so important. That's, that's the privileged mm -hmm. moment in which we can then once again tap into this and draw strength from it. So it's not, not repeating at all. Sometimes we use the word re representing. I prefer mm -hmm. the word, uh, it, 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 and it will sound kind of psychological, but the Eucharist actualizes the Paschal mystery. Hmm. It's, 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 it's the moment where it continues on until we're called to the kingdom of God. So hmm. we're not repeating anything. And, and, and that's a very, and sometimes I will say that our doctrine um, sometimes probably sounded that way, or at least the practice hmm. sounded that way, that it was, a, that, but it never were repeated sacrifice. It's the same hmm. sacrifice tapped into. Hmm. Thank you so much. Thanks for uh, taking that question. Monsignor Irwin, the ninth model that you present in your book is entitled that of the active presence of Christ in the Eucharist. Many Protestant traditions maintain a theology of the, quote, real presence of Christ or the, quote, spiritual presence of Christ in the bread and the wine, but refuse to define it philosophically exactly what is, what is happening, what's going on. From a Roman Catholic perspective, why is it important to define in what appears to be precise philosophical terms, what's happening in the Eucharist. Thank you. Well, um, because the practice and the theology is so important to our life, we wanted to be as, as careful as possible. But, long, but philosophically, um, we inherited terms from Thomas Aquinas. Mm -hmm. and he inherited Aristotle and began to work out that kind of terminology and some church documents leading up to Trent, the 16th century, use the word transubstantiation. Hmm. Now, having said that, um, long before Aquinas, there was Augustine. And he didn't say transubstantiation at all. That was hmm. part of his vocabulary. It was a sacred sign. It was a meal. It was a mystery. Hmm. Um, and then you, you come to 20th century, and the Catholic Church had the Second Vatican Council, 1962 to 65. And a lot of our doctrines and practices were reviewed and, and some adjusted and changed, one of which is the liturgy. But at Vatican II, we were discussing how do you describe the Eucharist? And Pope Paul VI put a document out called The Mystery of Faith, in which he said, the most convenient way we've used, said this is transubstantiation. Mm -hmm. But you need not use that term. You can use any other term 
that, that says the entirety is changed from bread and wine into the body and blood. I uh, don't want to describe that. What's happened, therefore, is ecumenical dialogues with many churches have mm -hmm. issued statements whereby we we don't ignore, but we kind of back off the requirement of transubstantiation and respect mm -hmm. the fact that they that may not be the category of, that other folks want to use. So, for example, it was Martin Luther who would couldn't stand any kind of philosophical study of the of the, of the doctrines, and mm -hmm. he said that was really man made uh, it was poor, and he said it should be a biblical doctrine. Well, mm -hmm. this is my body. That brings ecumenical discussion in the 20th century, 21st century. Well, what, what does it mean? This is my body, and can we agree upon this without requiring transubstantiation? Well, yes, we can. Hmm. Hmm. Thank and, uh, if, if I can put it this way, I mean, um, in the 16th century, the term transubstantiation was the least inadequate term to describe a mystery. Hmm. Mm -hmm. But it's as good as it gets. But all all of those words fail in the in the in the mystery being celebrated. Hmm. Hmm. Thank you, sir. Monsignor Irwin. Many Christians today long for Christian unity. I know I long for Christian unity. And I uh, something about that statement that you said at the beginning is the Eucharist that makes the church the church uh, rings very true. Um, it is perhaps in the Eucharist where Christian unity could be fullest ex expressed in its fullest way. In what concrete ways would be appropriate for Christian traditions to be working towards intercommunion? Well, I, I take my lead here from the Anglican Roman Catholic International Dialogue. It's one of dozens of them, in which the participants there are talking about the fact, uh, asking the question, um, when will there be enough commonality about understanding what ordination means, mm -hmm. what it means to lead the Eucharist? Um, when will it be sufficient that, they, that we might share the Eucharist together as a means to fuller communion? In other words, right now, um, where part of the problem has to do with the notion of what it means to be ordained, authority in the church, papal authority, those kinds of things get into play. And therefore, it's less about the doctrine of the Eucharist on its own, but it's the underlying doctrines of papal primacy and ministry that, mm -hmm. that are, are, are the cause part of the problem. Mm -hmm. Therefore, um, so Archbishop Longley, who is in Birmingham on that committee, <clears throat> he said that he thought there should be occasional acts of intercommunion with Anglicans and Catholics to get to further communion. Well, that's a mm -hmm. new twist for us, and we've not said that in a way that has been that, 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 that striking. But when you think about it, there's so much we have in common, it should lead us to that. Now, I have to say, however, mm -hmm. that other churches mm -hmm. have different notions of ministry, and I think mm -hmm. um, even my own family, which is largely Lutheran, and my, family, my mother's side of the family, uh, mm -hmm. we can't have intercommunion right now, and it breaks my heart. But mm -hmm. I think if the theology of ministry gets a bit more solidified, that may happen. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and what I'm trying to say is, I, uh, it's, I mean, it becomes a very, very awkward thing emotionally to people. Am I not worthy? Of, am I not welcome? It has nothing mm. to do with not being worthy. It's the mm -hmm. question that if we belong together at the same belief, mm. the Eucharist is a logical progression to that. Um, mm. It ought not be something that is that the doctrines don't matter. They matter. And the question is, do you choose to believe those and live those? Well, then we can have communion. Hmm. Monsignor Irwin, we're very, very grateful for your time. If I can ask one last question, sir, sure. and it's a question that I've been asking uh, uh, all of those who come onto this program, uh, what would it mean today for the church to be united? What would that look like? And how would we recognize this unity? And perhaps what can we be doing today to work towards that unity? Thank you. Well, first of all, um, one size does not fit all. And what the Catholic Church is discovering experientially with Pope Francis is that really the Catholic population has changed so much from a, a, a European North American phenomenon to a South American, Latin American, African, Asian phenomenon. The, the population has shifted. So um, I want to begin by saying one size does not fit all. Basic structures of liturgy would be the same, but it wouldn't, they wouldn't be done with the same language or the same music or the same architecture. I mean, there would be differences there. So it would be a question of being very careful about refining what that was in terms of liturgy and sacraments. Also, we'd have the same creed. We would say the same creed, but the question there is, um, we're looking at the Catholic Church evolving in some way, the way we, we, our authority is evolving. 
um, we have a very, very active Pope, and we have had since John Paul II. And so the papacy is getting a lot more emphasis. But mm -hmm. on the other hand, in Roman Catholicism, we believe that the bishop of the diocese leads the diocese. And, and the question about collegiality of bishops is mm -hmm. part of us, you know, our doctrine. And certainly in the document about, uh, about creation, Holy Father has used 21 documents of bishops' conferences to quote, to put forward this, this. so he's using that collegiality. So on the one hand, it's papacy. On the other hand, it's synodality, meaning synod, meaning groups of bishops, collegiality. That's, mm. that's going to be, I mean, we're a work in progress. In other words, I, I, to be a united church, I'm not going to bring you a package and say, Jonathan, here's mm. Catholicism. It's mm -hmm. too big, it's too, it's too diverse. But here are characteristics of Catholicism that you might want to look at. It's been our privilege today to be speaking with Monsignor Kevin Irwin. Monsignor Irwin is the Walter J. Schmitz Chair of Liturgical Studies at the Catholic University of America and also the author of the book that we've been discussing today, Models of the Eucharist. Monsignor Irwin, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you.